Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Saturday, November 27th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The game against Michigan is today. Yes. Been waiting to say that for like a year and a half on this show. We've only done like 400 and something episodes. Finally got to say it. There you go. Between Buckeye Weekly and this show, we have talked about just about every possible angle to this weekend's Ohio State versus Michigan game already this week. The two keys to winning the game, what we learned from the Michigan State game, what we learned from Michigan's last game, the history of the top five matchups, our bold predictions, show looking specifically at how we thought the game would play out, the show looking yesterday at how we thought Michigan could win if Michigan was going to win. Probably a few more I can't think of at the moment. A bunch of live shows, college football playoff rankings, all that stuff. But outside of that one show with Bill Bender on some of the previous best top five matchups, we have not talked much about the history between these two teams and some of the most memorable games between them. So that's what we're going to do today. My guest is Buckeye Scoops, Tony Gerderman, a gentleman I've watched more than a couple Ohio State Michigan games with over the years. Tony, thank you for joining me. Um, thank you for having me. It is an honor to finally be here on the day. <laughs> The holiest of days on the Ohio State football calendar, yes. Uh, You know, I thought about for this very special day, putting together some kind of like structure for the show, you know, ranking the most memorable games we've seen in person or something like that. And then it was like, nah. All right, we're just going to talk about some games. I I will even I will even allow you to go first. I think I think the only structure I'm going to provide here is this needs to be a game you've seen in person. So give me an Ohio State game that really pops out to you as a game that you have seen in person that was like. This is one I'm going to remember 50 years from now. Oh, wow. I, and it's, I'm going to go straight to 1995. Now, that was my second Ohio State Michigan game in person. That was my sophomore year at Ohio State. And this is a story I've told. We've talked about Michigan games <clears throat> many times, but uh, I got me and my roommate got tickets through uh, Block O. I had to attend a meeting for it. I, I may have also, we may have also signed up for like, uh, I don't know, some, some timeshare. So I don't know if I owe Blocko some money over the years. I, I'm sure interest has not accrued on that. But we got another uh, ticket for our high school buddy. And so we went up that morning. I ended up stopping somewhere along the way on 23 or 75 to buy an Eddie George jersey, like a knockoff Eddie George jersey out of, from a Walmart or something. We had a hibachi. We had, uh, we had some burgers. It was too cold. We couldn't get the, the, the hibachi going when we got to uh, what got parked. We're going to tailgate and there's no couldn't get a fire going for our burgers. That was probably the first sign that things weren't going to go well. And then, you know, you get into the game and Tim Biakabatuka runs all over the place, kept running. We were in the end zone seating and down by the, the like third, second, first row. And he just kept seemed like he just kept running to us like enough. We've seen you enough. We don't want to see you anymore. And then, you know, it's, it's a crowded in there and it's, you get out and the, uh, I, I don't remember much from that day. I do remember like two kids, a brother and a, and a sister, like eight and 10 laughing at us and flipping us off while their parents, you know, good job. We've raised you right. The police on doing the crosswalk stuff. were offering like discount roses, roses for sale. Anybody wants some roses, stuff like that. And really. It really stuck with you. And, and it's experiences like that, which allows me to remain connected to the rivalry, no matter how out of sorts it gets. Cause that stuff like that, that never leaves you. And that's, you know, we'll talk about 96 and 97, but that 95 game was cause 94 is my freshman year. Ohio state beat him. I thought, I don't know what's so hard about this. And then you go up, up there and Ohio state was considerable favorites and they had, you know, lost 31, 23 and, and had to work hard to keep it that close. Yeah. That one, that one was the, my, before my freshman year, that was my senior year of high school. And I, I remember with, I was out in Ohio for Thanksgiving to visit grandparents. And uh, I remember watching the pregame show and watching like the first half of that game. And my parents were like, all right, we're going to go, we're going to start driving home. I was like, but the game, eh, and then listening to the game on the radio. And it just was not, it did not go great. Did not go as expected. Uh, 96 was my freshman year. I had the Ohio State clinched the Rose Bowl the week before the Michigan game, beat Indiana. So I, I had booked my tickets. I was going to the Rose Bowl. I was so excited. It was the most exciting thing in the world. Ohio State is unbeaten and going to the Rose Bowl my freshman year. It's going to be amazing. And then they kicked three field goals in the first half, Tony. It didn't go great after that. Uh, 
John Spring slipped, Tyree Screed scored a touchdown, and Ohio State managed to get shut out in the second half and lose 13 to 9 to a team that was four wins, five wins, or five, I'm sorry, four losses that year, right? maybe five losses that year. Ohio State was like a almost a three touchdown favorite, if I remember correctly. There were, I think there were only two Ohio State games where I sat in the stadium after the game for a while going like, well, why did I just, what? How did that just happen? It was that and uh, 98 Michigan State. Those were the two that were like, what? That didn't, no. I, I, I must have seen that incorrectly. And yeah, that one was, that was fun. 97, uh, I uh, slept outside. The Ohio Staters Club had a bus trip up to Ann Arbor. It was another year when Ohio State had only lost one game. They lost to Penn State, a classic game, 31-27 in Happy Valley. Other than that, they ran the table. Michigan had run the table. Huge game, college game day game, top five matchup. And uh, slept outside. Uh, it snowed that night. I slept outside the old Ohio Union to assure, have a place in line. It snowed that night. I got tickets. I also got sick. Don't think I did real well on the uh, test. I had the following day in, I'm going to say it was a math class, but it's been quite a while since then. And uh, went up there. Had seats, much like you, in the second row behind the end zone. Had Charles Woodson running a punt directly back towards me. And then it took uh, probably the better part of an hour to get out of the stadium from row two to up to row, uh, you know, triple Z, wherever they have the exits. That was great. That was that was also a lot of fun. Uh, the only other time that I was up in, in Ann Arbor in the uh, Cooper era was 99, last, last year of Co- the Cooper era. They boo all the Ohio State players. And they say, and head coach of the Buckeyes was John Cooper. And there was just loud roar. And I went, oh, I remember how this goes. And then it went like that. Yeah, and that 96 game, that was as that was like the epitome of the, the Cooper stuff, where it just didn't matter. Like it, One way or another, Michigan was going to get that win. And Ohio State was much more talented. And it still didn't matter. And it, that one is still, I'm with you. There are two games where you just sat there and uh, you just try to examine like what have i done to make am i i'm still wearing that my, this is my lucky shirt my lucky hat i know uh at the 95 game that i went to the eddie george jersey did not come back with me the the 98 michigan state game that i was wearing did not come back with me like i don't want that juju with me that's you're gone um so yeah those the road trips uh, and, and, and also the home games back then to be a part of that, that, that stays with you forever. I mean, that's why, you know, it, it, we cover the team. And so it, it's different now, but I still like, it gets the blood going. It gets the juices going. Like this is still very real to me. And it, it's uh, the, the generation after us, because we're not old it's these young people now, like if, if they've never experienced that kind of heartbreak and just like, how did this happen? You don't think it can happen, but we have seen it happen and wondered how did this happen? So we know it can happen at any time. Well, and the game that changed it all was 2001. I, that was, I know you were not there. You know, you've only been to Ann Arbor once. I was there in 2001. I was working for channel four in Columbus and uh, had a, a spot on the camera deck on the top of the old uh, press box at Michigan Stadium. So I was away up there and it was a little brisk and uh, you're not going to believe it from our host at Michigan game. It was a little bit chilly and cold and extremely overcast. I know I was shocked too. Uh, I, I actually was shocked when Ohio State scored three touchdowns in the first half, three Jonathan Wells touchdowns. And then he either got a cramp or a sprained ankle. And I've kind of heard the story both both ways, but uh, you know, he's he then he's out. Ohio State uh, gets two free points when Michigan brings in uh, Jermaine Gonzalez, the backup quarterback, and uh, he's not paying attention. And the ball gets snapped through the back of the end zone. It's twenty three nothing at Ohio State at halftime, and like every Ohio State fan there is going like, "What has happened? I don't understand what is going on." In the very best kind of way, and then they hold on for absolute dear life in the second half. Uh, Marquise Walker drops a ball that hits him right in the number four on his chest on a post route in the end zone. And they hold on and win 26 to 20. That is, I'm going to say that is it, that is still one of the like happiest groups of Ohio state fans I've ever seen at any time. Just, they had not won in Ann Arbor since 1987 at that point. So 14 years between wins in Ann Arbor and Trestle did the 310 days thing. 
And then they followed through on it. And it was like, oh, that, that was weird. That was that was extremely weird. I've seen a bunch of unexpected results up here. This was an ex unexpected result as well, but uh, very different than the previous ones. Were you with the 2002 game? I was not. I went from 98 until 2014 between oh, wow. games. Yeah. So it, it was a... Um, it, it was it was a long absence, and uh, there there was a time where it just felt like it'd be too expensive to even try to mm -hmm. get into these games. You know, even like forget about the two thousand six game. Like I, you were there, right? You were. I was. Yes. Yeah. I was way at the top of South Stands for that one. That that is maybe the worst seats I've ever had for an Ohio State game. But I was, in, you know, technically inside the building. So yeah, that one was good. I was there for two thousand two. I was working in TV, but I was on the field for most of the game. And then at the end of the game, I had to go back to the station and produce the evening, the six o'clock sports cast. So they, and they needed my pass for one of the other photographers. So I was on the field for the, up until the point where they scored to take a 14, nine lead late in the game. And then I had to go back to the station. So I watched the end of that game on TV, which was not how I would have chosen to experience that, but that's all right. Fortunately, uh, yeah. it's not a long drive to channel four. From no, the stadium. Yeah, yeah. and uh, no one was leaving that game early, so there was not a lot of traffic, so that was good. <laughs> uh, I was there for 2004, came down, and everyone was like, why don't you want to go see this? Because Michigan was going to Michigan was gonna win the game, go to the Rose Bowl. Ohio State had this kind of lost season, and then, uh, then, and, and then Anthony Gonzalez caught a touchdown right away, and Ted Ginn returned a punt, and it was like, oh, hey, I think they found their quarterback. I don't think it's Justin's Wick. I think I think we may, may have made the wrong decision at the beginning of that season. Yes, um, 2005 I was there. 2006 I was there. 2006 was a. I mean that was it, that was a remarkable, remarkable week. And if you were too young to remember that game, it was number one versus number two. Bo Schembechler died the night before the game, the day before the game, the morning of Friday morning. He was at a TV station in Detroit that my wife worked at, and. Uh, he, he died uh, while he was at the station to record the uh, the Saturday show. They, they recorded the Big Ten ticket show at WXYZ in uh, Detroit. He died at the station the day before the game. It was like this, like, I mean, the, the week of just the most insane buildup you've ever heard. And then there's this just shock on Friday morning. And man, that was, it was like it sucked all the air out of the entire thing. And then Saturday came and it was like, and then everyone just like re it like was like the, the cabin, like depressurized and then like repressurized again on Saturday. And then it was like back into it. It was, it is the craziest game I've ever been to just in terms of the atmosphere around it and the emotions around it and all of that. Um, you know, and boy, it, it has not aged as well as it could have uh, given what happened after that game. But in the moment, man, that was a big, big, big game. And of all the games for HBO to follow, like, you know, that they chose that Ohio State Michigan game and the build up there for the documentary a year later. But that was that was a good choice, in, at least in terms of the drama that, mm -hmm. you know, good luck finding a, a one versus two matchup between these two teams, because I think that's the only one. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the only one. Yeah. Yep. And there's been a two versus three just a couple of years ago, I think. And mm -hmm. of course, you got two top five matchups in this one. But yeah, I, I was watching that one with a bunch of buddies. Uh, and it was, it, there was a lot of jumping around and making sure you didn't hit your head on the ceiling at that point. <laughs> like Chris, with Beanie Wells' touchdown run, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, and and the, uh, the, the play action bomb where they brought Ted Ginn into mm -hmm. tight end, it was like, I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, why is Ted Ginn lined up? Oh dear Lord, this is, oh, I see what's happening here. And and I, that was one of those, like, it just like clicked in your head. Like, nope, something is happening here. Something very strange is happening here. I don't think Ted Ginn's in, in there to run block for short yardage. That is not what I think is about to happen here. I, I'm still shocked that Michigan didn't see that and call timeout, but Ohio State kind of hustled to the line and I think they didn't have time to react to it. So, all right, so let's move on. You, you are, we'll get, we'll move into the Urban Meyer era now. So go ahead and go ahead and share your uh, your your next one. Uh, 2014 would have been my next one, and that one obviously was for to to go to the Big Ten championship. That one was close throughout, and Ohio State like get a 
Ezekiel Elliott touchdown run and a Darren Lee touchdown return. But before that, JT Barrett goes down and in comes Cardale Jones. And that's when I think uh, Ezekiel Elliott runs for that touchdown. And, but I do remember you're up in the press box and JT Barrett is out. He's gone for a while. Then all of a sudden you hear people saying, JT Barrett's in the stands. And then you look at the uh, uh, look up at the TV and JT Barrett had come down into the to the stands and was sitting and watching the game because he wanted to see it like on his crutches or whatever. And like, I've never seen that before, but uh, he, he did that and wanted to, to be out there and watching it. But that I, that one is kind of almost gets forgotten because of 2016 for me in 2017, another one where JT Barrett gets hurt, but mm-hmm. the, the, that one was good. Were you there for that one? No, no. I, I was watching that one on home at home on TV, and that yeah. I mean, JT Barrett goes down. I was like, well, that's too bad. There, there goes the season because I uh, I took my daughter who was at that point four years old to the Indiana game the week before, and uh, you know she was four years old, so we did not stay for the whole game because it was cold and icy that day. And as we were walking out of the stadium, Indiana is beating Ohio State in the you know end of the third quarter or whenever it was. And you know, like we got out to the parking lot and we hear this loud roar, and it was Jalen Marshall with one of his four touchdowns, and they eventually eventually take the lead. But as I was walking out of that stadium against Indiana the week before that, not once did it occur to me, I bet this team's about to win the national championship in like a month and a half. Like that was not what I was expecting, and that was definitely not what I expected when uh, JT Barrett went down with the injury too, because that was, you know, he, he was he was. I think he still won the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year award that mm-hmm. year, despite being injured. And uh, yeah, the following week was was uh, with the Wisconsin game. I remember, I remember very clearly. I don't remember many of my tweets, but before that game, I tweeted like, "No outcome." You know, any I'm prepared for like any outcome in this game, other than an Ohio State blowout. Like that's the only thing that's definitely not going to happen. And uh, I'm pretty sure I left that as my pinned tweet for about five years after that because nailed it um so all right so 2016 i was not there again i was visiting family in texas so i watched the end of that game on my phone in the airport hoping to the sweet lord in heaven that they were not going to call my plane because it it was like boy this game keeps going doesn't it it just it just keeps going so uh, i'm sure it was a little more exciting where you were yeah and really what i remember most about that game is finally being down on the field for so much of it, you know, we get down there for the final five or six minutes of the fourth quarter. And then there's some overtimes going on and you go from one end zone to the other, you're hustling back and forth and where all of the action is. And uh, I thought for sure they were going to keep Wilton Spate from scoring in that one overtime and they didn't. And then get a hustle down to the other end of the field and down in the, the very same corner where Curtis Samuel scored and that, that entire drive, uh, you know, recorded on my phone, it's uploaded on YouTube where JT Barrett clearly gets the first down. Everybody sees it. I know some people think <laughs> there's some controversy there, but the 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 Curtis Samuel play, uh, the, the, the swing pass to Curtis Samuel, the, the double reversing of the field, uh, and then him almost breaking free. And just it, it's one of the more remarkable plays, maybe the more remarkable forgotten plays in in the, the rivalry history, I think. You could say it's as as important as the Maurice, Maurice Claret wheel route. I mean, mm-hmm. it's that one people remember. If he doesn't pick up, if Curtis Samuel doesn't pick up the nine yards or whatever to make this a a, a fourth and one type of decision, uh, there's who who knows what ha- what's happening. And then uh, I, I do remember Pat Elfline talking about the winning play, saying afterwards once they called that play, who he, he knew they were going to score on it because of how Michigan had been playing and how they knew how effective they would be blocking it. So once they called that play, he was like, Oh, we win. And mm-hmm. and then they did. And just being in that corner with all of the players, it's just going crazy. And then trying to get from that corner to the, what the, the, the South West corner, so, Southeast diagonally across yeah, the southeast, field to yeah. the Southeast. Yep. To, to get to the post game and, crossing all of these paths with all these people going crazy, crazy. And then finally get to that corner and there's, there's urban and Ryan stamper and they're just watching all of, they just keep showing the highlights on the scoreboard. 
everybody's swinging Sweet Caroline. And then, uh, you know, uh, Urban Sun finds him and you're just, nobody wants to leave. And everybody's out on the field, just enjoying it, watching the highlights, singing, and just just standing there and enjoying the moment because you don't you don't get to see many overtime matchups in this one. And like nobody, you just wanted to stay there and bask in it. And because once you left, like the experience leaves with you, even though you're going to remember it. But the longer you can stay there and soak it in, because uh, that that doesn't happen every day. Yes, soak in the last points they're going to score that season. You don't want to let those go. That is uh, <laughs> too soon. No, okay. Um, we mentioned 2017. 2017 really doesn't. I mean, like of all the of all the games, you know, the last few years that that one was not as big to me. I mean, it was kind of crazy. It was, you know, JT Barrett getting getting hurt pregame and he still plays, but he was kind of compromised, and then all of a sudden in the second half. It's a 20, what, 21, 20 game or something like that. And uh, he gets hurt and he's out and they're bringing in Dwayne Haskins, who, you know, at that point was kind of an unknown. He was, he was the guy who the week before against Illinois in a rainstorm had just kind of looked crappy. They hadn't, they hadn't done much on offense. He had thrown a pick six against like UNLV at the beginning of the season. He was not, you know, now he's Dwayne Haskins, legendary Ohio state quarterback who throws for a trillion yards and beats out Joe Burrow for the job. But then he was just like the backup quarterback who, I don't know, there was a video of him as a little kid in the locker room saying something cute and uh, he'd been kind of inconsistent. And now he's thrust into this game on the road. It's a very close game. And he makes this incredible throw to Austin Mack. He makes this incredible run down to the one yard line. And all of a sudden, you know, they're they're in control. Mike Weber scores a touchdown because he's contractually obligated to score a touchdown against Michigan every single time he plays them. And they win. Half of my memories of that game, even though I was there, are all filtered through that eight, the Amazon series that came out afterwards, where you're seeing like Pep Hamilton just like emotionally just shatter as John O'Corn throws just it's a ridiculous interception to uh, Jordan Fuller, right? Was that Jordan Fuller that picked that one off? Mm-hmm. Damon Webb, one of those guys. But yeah, that was, uh, you know, I mean, just in terms of like sheer import of that game, that was not really incredible. But I mean, the post game. I mean, of all the of all the Urban Meyer post games, that one was right up there. That was that, that's what sticks out most to me. One the first is like once JT Barrett goes down, you're like, oh, they're going to lose this. <laughs> this is what that feels like. I had forgotten, and then of course they they didn't. But that post game with Urban vowing to find the one armed man who <laughs> injured JT Barrett. Uh, and will we'll go down forever. And then JT Bear was in the post game as well. First, they brought out, I think, Dwayne Haskins, and then JT Bear came out and was displaying what happened. Like, just while I was standing here, and then somebody in a gray vest comes and hits me, and, you know, I had my foot planted, and my, and he's just like going through it again. I'm like, aren't you injured? Are you sure you want to show us th- how this happened? Like, now, now you're now both knees. It's like, oh no, you know, both knees. Um, but that was, that was a bizarre one. Another one, and then you can take back the 2016, the 2015 uh, post game or the 2017, rather. But but in 2015, Taylor Decker had said like, if they had let that Michigan State loss cost them against Michigan, then like all of the culture that they talk about would have been crap. It would have been worth nothing if they didn't come out and play well against Michigan. And of course, they you know 42 13 win. That was another memorable uh, post game. And really, the post games are sometimes more memorable because just talking to the players about the emotions and going back to, uh, we'll eventually get to 2019. So but like asking Ryan day, do you feel, are you happy or is it relief? Like what's the first feeling about winning the game? And it's, oh, it's relief because if you don't forget about it, but once you do, it's like, ah, now you can enjoy it. And that's why it's fun talking to the players afterwards as well, because now they can, you, you finally get a chance to enjoy this one thing that you've been working 364 days for. Yeah. And, and it's going to be, you know, that's not quite as much the case now because generally they have a game in Indy the week after that. I mean, back, back in the day, it was like, that was it. And then they know they're going to the Fiesta bowl to play Miami or they they know they're going to the, uh, you know, Fiesta bowl to go play Florida or whatever it is that, that was like, that was it. There was no big 10 championship game. That, you know, that's it. And now you're onto the bowl 
now that you've got generally you've got another another game coming after that. Uh, 2018 was I think the the 2018 is crazier when you think about these the week before. Generally, the week before the Michigan game is just kind of like a pro forma, like okay, whoever it is. They beat them, and then it's done. And then three seconds after that game is over, you never think about that game again because it's Michigan week, and it's just completely forgotten. That meant that that week before that game was that was the Maryland game the week before that. And uh, I mean, I think I think they just gave up another uh, seventy-five yard touchdown on a like poorly disguised misdirection. Like, just it was just it was incredible. It was the worst of defensive performance I think I've ever seen from an Ohio State team against a not particularly good opponent. Was it uh, Ty McFarland who was their running back that year? Ty uh, Johnson, Anthony Ty, McFarland, Anthony Both. McFarland. That was it. Okay, well, man, there you go. I give you a uh, what's that? A portmanteau, something like that. It, I, when you combine two things, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's, they, they, it's not quite. Uh, yeah, fifty-two, fifty-one. Uh, Dwayne Haskins had uh, three, I think, rushing touchdowns in that game. But yeah, goes into over the head of. Touchdown to uh, Benjamin Victor to tie it with like 30 seconds left. M- Maryland starts going down the field. Looks like they might win. It, might, might win it. Gets stopped. Ohio State ends up winning in overtime uh, on a uh, pass that was incomplete, but not by very much uh, on a two point conversion, 52 to 51. And the whole week was like, well, this is. I mean, this Michigan team, their defense is incredible. Is there any way Ohio State can hold Michigan to a low enough total? That Ohio State's terrible defense will be able to, you know, will, it, will Ohio State's terrible defense be able to hold Michigan to a low enough total that Ohio State might be able to just barely squeak it out against this this powerful Michigan defense all week long? I, I mean, we did we did all sorts of shows on, you know, what, why would this work well for Michigan? What you know, what, why is it, what's the good news for Ohio State? You know, can Ohio State win this game? Can Michigan win this game? And it was like it was like this really dramatic, uh, you know. And, and you had the Urban Meyer situation where he looked like he wanted to die every time he was on the sideline. And, you know, you'd heard all these reports that he was going to retire after the game and all that stuff. And that whole season was kind of a circus. And then the game starts. Tony, what happened after the game started? Uh, Ohio State just re- uh, uh, unrelentingly was able to throw the ball wherever they wanted, move the ball however they wanted. And and just it was it, w- it was eye opening how just like Ryan Day knew, obviously knows Don Brown very well. It was like you know how uh, Clemson steals signals. It's like you know, like Ohio State was stealing every de- defensive signal, but they didn't need to because let's just just run some crossers. Let's just do do this. Let's throw some deep balls and no, there there was no, there are no answers for Michigan. And you know they could have scored whatever they wanted. Ohio State would have just kept going and, and scoring more. And it was. It was an impressive performance out of the blue. Ohio State was a four and a half point underdog at home in that game to Michigan. And uh, this is a, a team that got blown out at Purdue and just they, it, it was as shocking a, a game. I mean, it made the next year's not shocking at all. And that's mm-hmm. how shocking because they just, Ryan Day had Don Brown's number, knew exactly what Don Brown likes to do and took advantage of it in a, in a lot of ways and kind of wrote the recipe on, on how to do that. And we see a few years later now, Don Brown is no longer there. Yes. They beat, they beat Don Brown all the way back to UMass. That is how badly they beat Don Brown. And, you know, you look at the, you look at the scores throughout history and I think Ohio, the most points Ohio state had ever scored before that was 50. they had scored and done that in 1961. They did that in 1968. They scored 50 points. And then they scored 62, 62. And it was like, they, they probably could have done more than that if they needed to. And it was only 62 39. Cause they gave up thir- uh, 14 points and 13 seconds at the end of the first half. Cause it was like, it was like 62 39 and not quite as close as the score might indicate. Cause it was just like, they, they could have run those little jet sweeps to Paris Campbell all day long and just kept on scoring 70 yard touchdowns. Cause there was just, there was no answer there. And then the year after that, they go up to Ann Arbor. And they score the second most points in series history. That's the last two times Ohio State has played Michigan. They've scored the first and second most points in series history that Ohio State has scored. Uh, and the 2019 game, I remember being in the car on the way up there with you. And, you know, all week long, I was like, well, Ohio State's clearly better. Ohio State's clearly better. Ohio State's clearly going to win this game. And then I think we, someone else was in the car with us. And they just were like, you know, 
Ohio State, what if Ohio State loses this game? You just like <laughs> there is this like weird sense that the morning of the game, everyone, you know, you anyone who's old enough to remember the '90s, you know, has that like weird sense. And then it was either the first or the second carry of the game. J.K. Dobbins fumbles, and the ball bounces on the ground and bounces straight back up into his hands. And it was it was like he was dribbling a basketball. He just like dropped it, bounced right back into him, and he just kept running. And it was like, ah, okay, I see. So this is not going to be Michigan's day then. Got it. Okay. Yeah, and really no, no answer for J.K. Dobbins. No answer for Justin Fields. Obviously, no answer for the receivers and. Justin Fields comes out and still one of the more incredible throws after he gets injured, comes back next play, throws it to Garrett Wilson down, uh, down the sideline into the end zone. And really, I, I think at that point solidifies himself in Ohio state lore as the, the best quarterback ever for me at that point, seeing what he was able to do. And, and this was not nearly the surprise that the year before was, and this was Ohio state. Just, we are better. We know we're better. We've got an amazing running game. We've got a quarterback and receivers that can do. And this was a group of receivers that Garrett Wilson was a freshman, Chris Olave is a sophomore, but it was still, I'm, Austin Mack may have been injured at that point, but they, Benjamin Victor, KJ Hill, not the most dynamic group, not like they are now, but still very, very effective. And uh, defensively, Ohio State had a really good defense that year. So credit Michigan for scoring 27. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, that, that one was – I do – the day of the game, you, there's just this – you know, you, you can see ghosts, you can hear things, then, like, yeah, Ohio State should – like, probably on Monday or Tuesday of that week, we're thinking 56-27, mm-hmm. but by the time it's <laughs> game time, you're like, 31-27? Is that, you know, <laughs> is that about right? And, no, it, it was much, much worse than that for Michigan and – um you know, unfortunately, Tom, none of us were at the game last year. Yeah, last year was uh, that that came out the the cancellation of the game came out while we were on the media Zoom with Ohio State uh, interviewing players. You know, the normal Tuesday interviews. We had talked to Ryan Day already, I think, and we're, we've talked to a couple of players, and then Justin Hilliard's up there. And it starts coming across Twitter. Like there've been these rumors like, Hey, it's not looking great. And the numbers aren't looking great at Michigan. And then it comes across Twitter and, you know, just poor Justin Hilliard, who has been there for you know six years and has just had this star crossed career and has finally earned a spot on the field and is finally starting. And he's, you know, he, he's taken on this big role and he's the leader on the team and they're undefeated. And it's, you know, how much is going to mean his senior day against Michigan. And this is the game they work for all year. And uh, SID Jerry Emig calls on the next reporter to ask a question. And Tony, who is that reporter? Indeed, it was me. And mm. that is when I had to ask Justin Hilliard, uh, well, first tell him that it looks like the game has been uh, canceled and then uh, ask for his feelings. And he was in denial and didn't want to believe it and was uh, told by others that, yes, this is true. And he was basically like well until i hear from the coaches and he he was clearly shook like you mm-hmm. could see in his face and in his words trying to find something to say and then at that point jerry emig ended the the interview session but it was like you know a plane goes down and, and everybody on board dies and you're like go going to the house of the somebody who was on the plane and be like hey did you did you find out about the plane what do you think about that and it's like you're you're springing me on springing this on me, and mm-hmm. uh, how do I process this? It's terrible, and um, it was. If you can go back and watch it, uh, YouTube. Um, I'm sure. Just go. You, you can find it on YouTube, and I am. Uh, I was the reluctant bad guy on that one. I'm not a bad guy in real life, mm. despite what Tom says, <laughs> but I certainly felt like uh, a villain on that day. Yeah, you know, you you hear them talk about Michigan all year round, and you hear them talk about how they they work it every every day of the season, and you go through the Woody Hayes, and there's there's two different walls dedicated, like huge wall size displays dedicated solely to this game with countdown clocks, and you know this is you know very clearly this is something they care about very deeply. But that was, you know, it's easy to say that, and then 
that was the moment where you got to see like this real unfiltered look at like what this means. And this is something they work for all year long. And this is the last chance playing the horseshoe. And this is, and to have that taken away and like, like to see that moment, that was, that was maybe the single most powerful moment of the 2020 football season to me. That was like, man, that was, cause you get, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of come out and say the right things and always oh, matters a lot. And we take the right, you know, that was like, there was, there was no faking that. That was, that was one of the most real moments of the year and incredibly powerful. And, you know, I mean, probably a pretty good testament to what this game today is going to mean. I mean, this is, this is a game they've now been, now been working two years for. Mm-hmm. They finally get to play it today. So won't it be nice to see those uh, silver helmets and those uh, winged maize and blue helmets on the field again together, uh, just the way they're supposed to be. It will happen in Ann Arbor at noon today. Before that game, we will have our usual pregame show. Tony, Kevin Noon, and I will do our usual pregame show on uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that bell, subscribe to that channel. You'll get notified as soon as we, as soon as we go live. We'll be doing that uh, Saturday morning. for We usually go for at least an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes it's two hours. But we'll give you the availability report. We will give you all of our thoughts on the game, preview the game, answer your questions, all that good stuff. And then after the game, we'll be back again to talk about what happened, what you saw, what we learned, and what it will mean moving forward. If Ohio State wins, it will mean Indianapolis the following week. If Ohio State loses, it will mean, boy, we haven't had had that conversation in a while. But uh, either way, it's going to be a fascinating day. And either way, Ohio State and Michigan are playing football again just the way it's supposed to be. So can't wait for that. Can't wait to uh, talk to you guys a little later on this morning for the pregame show and then for the postgame show. And then uh, should be another fun week of football uh, conversation next week in Columbus as well. So thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll see you a little later on.